This is Success Beyond the Score, giving insights and tips to help you learn how to build your music career from the best in the field by Millicent Stevenson. Millicent is a multi-award winning saxophonist and endorser of Harry Hartman's Fiber Reads. She is currently serving on the Executive Committee of the Musicians' Union. With over 40 years experience in the creative industry, Millicent has honed her performance and business skills. She provides personal development training and coaching via her online platform, successbeyondthescore.com. Today, my guest is Mr. Tony Bean. Tony is the CEO and founder of 5AM Records. He is an international artist developer, songwriter and record producer. He has worked with major record labels such as Polydor, Motown and Warner Brothers. Today on Success Beyond the Score, Tony talks about what it's like being a self-made producer who created a full-time music career spanning 30 years by following his heart and navigating the industry. What's it like to be signed? The impact of lockdown and five tips to help you establish yourself as a music producer. By the way, you will notice a slight difference in the sound quality of the interview. That's because at the moment, because of coronavirus and social distancing requirements, the interview took place using Zoom over the internet, but the content is A+. Here is Tony Bean. Thank you so much for um, agreeing for me to interview you for my podcast, Success Beyond the Score. And uh, this is the first time you're the first interviewee for season two. So you're right. actually the first one that said yes. I mean, I've got other people queued up. So, Tony, here is my first question for you. Oh, I don't know where to put my okay. thing here. So I'm looking down at this. Uh, how would you describe yourself and your music career now? So people just get a sense of who is this? Tony Bean that she's invited in, you know, what's he got to say for oh, himself? So. Oh, dearie me. And what don't be I? embarrassed. Don't play <laughs> coy. Let, this is the time to sing it loud and be proud. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think, um, I think I'm at a stage now, my music career is, I'm at a more mature stage in my music career. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a stage of consolidating certain things. Yeah. Um, working on things that I want to work on now rather than having to work on things. Mm. Um, I, I'm at the fortunate position of probably choosing more of my projects than I used to. Yeah. Um, and I think that's invaluable in a lot of ways because I, I think when you're building something, you have to do everything you can to build it. You stay yeah. busy, you work hard. Mm-hmm. do very long hours, taking every project you can take in to get your name out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'm at a stage now where I basically more choose what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I look at projects and think, well, do I want to get involved in that? Is that something I want to do? Is that something I want to develop? And I choose more of the things I want to do now, which is, I think that's the season I'm in, really, of my, my, my career. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm not... Not that I don't graft, I do still graft, but I don't think I am as anxious about um, making a name for self and making it and all the the success sort of side of things that you sort of caught up with when you were early early on in your career. Yeah. Um, it's more now consolidating it and looking at my own terms of success, what I want to do with my time and with my, my music. So how long have you been in music then? Because you say you're at the more mature end. So how long have you been in it? <laughs> Don't ask me that. That gives my age away. <laughs> no, I've, I've been playing. I mean, I've been doing music professionally hmm. since the 90s. Okay. So it's, um, I mean, I've been with my present business partner, Colin, for um, 20, nearly 30 years now. Wow. Um, we're going on 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've got my first record deal in 1990, mm. so that tells you how long I've actually been at this. Um, so it's 30 years, really. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow. So when you yeah. left school, did you go straight into becoming a professional musician? No, no, no. I um, I, I, I love music. My mum was a musician. Yeah. 
Um, strange enough, when I say that to people, they're usually like your mom. And my mom was a Jamaican woman, um, yeah. but she she was privileged enough to have had music lessons in Jamaica. Um, so she played piano, read music. She played guitar as well, which was unusual. Oh. And she, she taught me guitar um, to begin with. She's the one that actually taught me to play. Oh, wow. um, but we had instruments at home. Um, there's guitars at home. There was, there's a piano at home. So I learned at home um, from her. Um, but when I, uh, my dad was a non-musician. My mom was a musician. Okay. So, so it was more about finding a trade when you, when you were leaving school, finding something to do as a career. Um, so I, I think I did sort of several things when I left school. Um, went to college, obviously. I wanted to do more laboratory work, chemistry, that side of thing, pharmaceutical sort of side of things. Um, went to pursue that and found out I didn't like it. Um, and I think as the years went on, my mum realised that he's only going to settle for music. Right. As much as to, to my dad's discontent. Um, <laughs> That's not a job. So, uh, <laughs> it's not a job. It's not a real job. Yes. It's not going to give you a living. You're yeah. not going to earn anything out of it. So it was that sort of debate for many years for me. Um, and... I think with the backing of my mama, I really sort of started to pursue the music side of things. Um, and that was the sort of start of me producing music was, I think my earliest type memories of it was getting cassettes and, and doing that whole cassette thing, recording stuff, yes. swapping cassettes, yes. and overlaying stuff and finding yes. out how I remember that well. That. <laughs> that <laughs> and most musicians I know remember those times um, yeah. of, of working out how to actually record stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I I got a part-time job um, working in retail and I saved up and bought myself a Porter Studio, mm-hmm. which was one of those four-track recorders. And that was my start of a love affair with producing music. From that. Wow. Wow. Um, so it really sort of bit me. And I thought, I love the idea of putting music together, listening to how things work together, mm. um, how songs are constructed. And that, that was the start of it for me. So how did you sort of make it into a professional career? What, how did you transition from, uh, I, want to, I want to be a, in the science field, it's not working out mm-hmm. for me, I've got a bit of pocket money or pay or whatever, I bought my little bit of kit. But, but how did you move from that to becoming this established producer who works full-time and earns a living through your music? Um, it was, <laughs> it's a difficult transition, but I, my entry into it was, was from the writing side of things. I yeah. found that, that um, producing music's one thing, but I think being able to write songs and, I mean, initially you don't have anything to produce, so you are, as a producer, you are waiting for something to, to, to record, to produce, to put together. Yeah. For me, it was more a case of getting the Porter Studio um, and writing music, writing stuff, um, writing songs. Um, in the early days, I was, I was writing sort of gospel songs for little groups that I was in, recording them on the Porter Studio. I learned to write and construct songs. Um, my entry into the professional side of things was through that because I was doing session work as a guitarist. Um, met Michael Grant from Musical Youth. Oh, okay. And um, it was through that sort of setup. When Michael heard what I was doing at home with my, my little recording setup, he said, do you realise the sort of stuff you do? It's, it's got some value to it musically and, and professionally. Um, and we started to make sort of demos. At the time, it was a case of making demo tapes for record companies. Yeah. Um, started making demo tapes. I met Colin around the same time that I met Michael. And Colin was a DJ. He bought some equipment, um, recording equipment. He was doing sort of remixes as a DJ. Hmm. And um, we came together and he thought, you know, you're a musician. I'm more a technical sort of mix guy. Let's put our resources together and we could probably do something. And Michael came in on it and thought, well, I know the guys that would want to listen to all of this. Yeah. So basically I started to record. Colin was the mix engineer on some of the stuff I did. He had a small eight track and a few bit of equipment. So we pulled our equipment. Mm. I started to write. Michael had the contacts in the industry, obviously from his musical youth days. Mm. And we started to shop demo tapes around to different record companies. He set up meetings. We went down to stuff for people. Mm. And that's how my first record deal came along. 
Oh, okay, excellent. So that was your first record deal. So was that um, just a production deal? Was that a distribution deal? No, it was actually, it was was funny because my first record deal, I, I, we signed to Polydor and um, it was as, as a band. So I went in with the idea of having a group. It was just a three piece of vocalist, me and Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, And we went in, we got this deal with Polydor and it was sort of after a couple of months of, of us getting our stuff together, um, the label said, well, actually, we like what you do, so we'd like you to translate that to some of our other artists. Oh. Um, and it's, it was a blessing and a curse in some ways because I then got distracted from the group side of things and started working for the label side of things. So it was working in development with other artists on the label Mm-hmm. writing and producing for them. Um, and the group sort of got a little sidetracked. Mm. And that's how I ended up more in the production side of things because mm. I started producing for other people um, and I was getting work through the label. So it was through that that the, um, the label actually said, well, being as you're doing all that sort of stuff, they set up the studio for me mm. in Birmingham. I didn't want to move to London particularly. It wasn't, just wasn't my thing. Um, yeah. I wanted to stay in Birmingham. And they said, well, we'll set up something in Birmingham for you. Mm-hmm. And they set up a studio in Birmingham for me to use, um, mm. or for me to have. And that's where it all started from that point. Mm. So how did um, the group take it that you were sort of now going towards production and things? How did, how did <laughs> that go <Not> down? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Because <laughs> I, in my season one, I talked about bands and their breakups and stuff like that. So this yeah, is a really good one. You tell me what you already tell me what happened. <laughs> there's a lot of that sort of stuff. We had the thing is because we only used um, vocalists, mm. um, it, it got quite touchy at times because um, we went through three different sets of vocalists actually really um yeah and and that was on three different recording contracts really Um, yeah because each time that i started stuff it was and i we had three different record deals so there was um we started with polydor got Mm. sidetracked with them because we were producing for, for the other artists on the label um and i then we got a deal with um we actually had a spell with Motown UK, which was oh fantastic. really, okay. And they had, they had a UK setup at the time, mm-hmm. and we signed to them. It was only for about twelve months, and then the whole relationship with the US side didn't work. Mm. Um, so we only did one project with them, um, and then we moved on again, brought in another vocalist, and we got a deal with Warner Brothers here. Mm-hmm. Um, we released two singles under 5AM, under the name 5AM with them. Yeah. And um, again, that fell apart because, again, it was a case of paying attention to the group and not doing so much production. But I think my heart was in the production, really, rather than being a pop star or doing yeah. that side of things. It was just, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the, 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 we did sort of some TV stuff. We did a whole load of radio stuff where we had to go out and do whole days of on the road doing interviews and I just didn't enjoy that I wanted to be in the studio mm. with something that I preferred mm. um, and I think that that really made me hone what I wanted to do mm. in terms of, of really produce and write that mm. was where my heart was so when you were doing the label stuff Michael who was with you now was with you then yeah. Yeah. So how did you become best of friends to be still sticking together 30 years after like, I don't want to play with you guys, man, I got to produce. <laughs> Michael, it's funny because Michael's now, he, he's not actually a part of 5am anymore. Oh, okay. Um, because he's left the country. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Michael, Michael's in Canada now. He's, um, he's a dad of three. Yeah. Um, and he's a retired musician as far as he's concerned. Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> so it's only me and Colin now. Okay. Um, I mean, we're still, we're still great friends. Anyway. Yeah, but, um, yeah. I think Michael's had a longer term in the industry than I have, so I've yeah. got to give him his views. He's now a granddad in the industry. Yes, as far yes, as, musical as, use. As he's yeah. younger than I am. He's, yeah. he, 
from being a child in it. It's like mm. I can understand why he wants to take a break from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So he it? wants to feed his family and, and raise his kids really. So sure. Yeah. So <laughs> who are some of the people that you sort of produce for or work for when you were in Warner and Polydor and Motown? <sighs> um when we were Polydor, we we um it's funny because we worked a lot of development stuff. So we worked with um we did some stuff that um, with, oh gosh, Omar. Omar, was yeah. On at the time. Um, we did um, stuff with um, Nisha Paris's sister, mm-hmm. uh, who was, at the time her name was Alicia Waller. Oh, yeah. Um, we did, um, we were there actually when they set up, because we run the same management company as um, Eternal. Oh, yeah, Eternal, yeah. So we were sort of part of the whole formulation of that as well. So when they were doing all the auditions mm. for the group, we yeah. were sort of part of that setup as well. Okay. Um, but there was um, there's a group called m and that we did um, the early work for. Um, I think most people might remember it as um, there was a track called, they did called I've Got a Little Something For You. Okay. Um, in the early days on Polydor. Um there was, um, who else was that? I mean, going back years now into the 90s, yeah. I'm trying to remember all of that. Who are some of the sort of yeah. recent people that you're working with? Well, the thing is, I mean, we, with leaving a lot of the labels, what mm. we did was when we went independent, we got to work with sort of several different labels, especially doing the remixes, which was real fun because we were able to basically exercise our creative freedom with stuff. Hmm. I think what people don't realise is when you work with labels, it's very restricted in terms of you have to do what they're asking for. So you're not necessarily given the creative freedom to produce as you want to. It's right. very much a case of, could we have this? We need it like that. We want a bit of this. We want it to sound a little like that with a little of this. So it's very prescriptive. Hmm. Um, I think being independent and working as an independent producer um, you get to flex your muscles a bit more in terms of, especially with remixing and doing mixes for this for the UK. Mm. Um, you get to basically have a bit of creative freedom, which is great. Um, so, I mean, we enjoyed doing sort of mixes for there was labels like Sony and um, Arista. Um, so we did stuff like Tyrese's. We did a lot of Lamar stuff. Mm. Um, we did Tyrese, we did Kelly Rowland. Mm-hmm. Um, That's Kelly Rowland. Um, Destiny's Child. Destiny's Child, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there was um, some Usher stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Christina Aguilera. Mm-hmm. There was quite a few US artists as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there was some UK artists, like I say, Lamar. Mm-hmm. We did some Day of Night stuff as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a, Oh, Lord, you so you me? see, at the beginning, when I said you needed to be in the studio so people could see all your accolades, and you're like, oh, no, uh, no, 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 Kelly no, Rowland, no, Usher, no, 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 no. <laughs> Beverly Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I said you're a heavyweight. I know you're a heavyweight. Oh, you're no. Playing it down. You're so humble. Well, you know, it's good, really. It's good to be humble because sometimes you can, people can be a bit big headed and then it just gets in the way you don't want to be in the same room as them so it's, it's, it's you know what it's not a good thing to be like that I think one of the lessons I learned pretty early on mm. is um I I remember we there's a story I always tell that we were um with one of the singles we were doing we with, with Warner Brothers we did a a single that we shot a video for as mm. a group and um you know we went to this video shoot and they treat you like royalty with these things so you Basically, you have people there to get your stuff. And all you do is just sit and wait for your camera shots, all the stuff you've got to do. Mm. Um, food's all laid out. Everything's all laid out. And we had, at the beginning of the day, we had um, we had the director come to us and he said, oh, this, this young guy is going to be your runner. So he gets everything you need. If you need water, if you need food, if you need whatever. Yeah. So we sat there and sort of looked at each other because the food's all laid out. The water's there. It's a couple of steps away. Mm. But you're meant to ask somebody this person to, go, to get it. it. Wow. Well, this this young guy sat down and um, Michael got up, got a bottle of water, and he said, I'm supposed to get that for you. And Michael said, what? 
I can walk for myself. Thank you very much. It's okay. Yeah. See, take a seat, take the weight off. And he yeah. said, I can't do that. And he said, well, so I said to him, just sit down. We're going to have a chat. Mm -hmm. And we started talking to him about the work experience he was doing and stuff. Had a blast with him all day. He didn't do anything for us. He just chatted. At the end of the day, the um, owner of the video company came over to us mm. and she said, oh, hi, I'm introduced herself. And she said, I used to be the head of EMI. Oh, right. um, I now run my own video company. Mm. And she said, I just want to say something. I'm, I hope you guys keep it real. She said, the young man that you were with today is my son. I just wanted oh. him to get some work experience. And he told me how you treated him. And she said, please stay the same. Mm. She said, because the people you meet on the way up are the people you're going to meet on the way down. Mm. And she said, just stay the way you are. Don't, don't, don't grow an ego in this industry. And I thought, look at that. That could have been a make or break situation. <laughs> definitely. Instantly. Definitely. So you don't know who people are. Yes. You treat everybody with respect. Treat everybody the same. Treat yeah. people with respect. Yes. And don't get too uppity about anything. Definitely. It's a, it's a really good point. You just don't know who, who that person is. And you could have said something and that's it. Game over, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely game over. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fantastic. And I, and I like that. Keep it real. I think it's a really, really good lesson. And mm. you obviously you've told us about how you get to where you are now. And you're at a point now where you can choose what you want to do and mm. stuff. Now, listen, it's, it's lockdown. It's COVID, tier one, two, three, all that kind of stuff. How have you coped during that time as a full-time um, musician, producer, you know, what's been the impact to your business and how are you surviving? It's more remote stuff that we've been doing. So we've, I've been able to do uh, more remote recordings in terms of people sending um, tracks in to be mixed, mastered, um, and also doing voice voiceover stuff, which is just single person stuff mm. um, that we've been able to do. And also as well, I've been able to get some writing done, which mm. has been good. So I've been able to spend some time writing, um, which helps because, again, I'm trying to build up my song portfolio, as it were, my publishing portfolio. So that's helped as well. Yeah. So it sounds like, although lockdown and COVID has been not good for many people, death mm. or whatever, in mm. some ways it's moved your business in a slightly different direction. You've had to find different ways to survive. Yeah. Do you think it's because you've built up a strong base that you were able to sort of um, divert at this time? Or is it just being luck or God instance? Or what, what, do, what do you think has been the thing that's allowed you to still survive during really difficult times when the industry is really saying it's being contracted, it's been different things are shut down, theatres aren't happening, this ain't happening. What, the, what do you think has made it possible for you to survive? I think the, um, I think it's a mix, it's a, yeah, it's a combination of, of it is, I think, a blessing mm. from God what I'm able to do, but um, it has been potentially as well part of the base that we've got in terms of we've, we've built up a fairly good reputation. Yeah. We've built up a fairly good client base as well mm -hmm. that knows what we do, mm -hmm. um, knows that we're able to work through certain things as well. Mm -hmm. Um and I think, yeah, that client base has helped. Having a client base that knows that you can diversify a little, that you're not just sort of pop music producers or not just R&B producers, but you can actually record things and master them um, has helped as well. That You have to be able to diversify. You can't just be on a one track, mm. one idea thing or a one, a one trick pony as it were. You have to be able to diversify Mm. And I think being able to offer technical expertise in terms of mixing and mastering alone without being a producer, um, to put my hat on as a mixing engineer and for Colin to be doing mastering as well, has, has, is another string to our bow. That's helped um, not just having to offer production services, mm. but being able to offer the tail end services as well. Mm. So... Um if someone was thinking, right, I want to go into production, I've got the skills and that, is there a lot of things they've got to do to establish themselves or would you advise that they follow a particular path first or how, what would you advise on that? I would say um, for, for someone going into it now, hmm. I'd 
I would definitely advise that they study it. Mm. Um, I took the long route of, of being self-taught. I think I'd have got to where I wanted to get to a lot quicker if I'd have actually studied it. But in the days that I wanted to go uni, there weren't courses on production and popular music. And it was either you get a grade eight in classical music and go to a conservatoire and study classical music. Yeah. But there weren't popular music courses. Um, now there are. There are a wealth of courses that you can do. There are degrees in in in, um, in music um, production, in uh, music tech. You can do all sorts of courses. You can do even courses in songwriting. But do the course in the sort of stuff you're passionate about, passionate about, and and then start to build a client base with what you do. Start to do. You have to do some free work. Mm. You have to do some work that's going to get your product out there. You have to have a vehicle for your product. So a lot of people say to me, well, oh, how do I get a remix? How do I get to, you know, do these remixes? How do I get to do this production? How do... But you're not going to get straight away to produce Beyonce Knowles. You, you have to have work that they can hear. Mm. So sometimes that might mean working with a young artist for very little fee or nothing or developing something for yourself but you have to get your stuff heard um that's something that i've always advocated is get yourself get your material heard mm. um and you have to you can't be afraid to invest in yourself um i have a lot of people that ask oh i need a break i want to record i want to do an album and i know that if you produce my album it's going to be fantastic i don't know maybe it might be but <laughs> Yeah. Have you done anything for yourself? Have you actually bought a microphone? Have you bought a uh, a piece of recording equipment? Mm. Have you bought an instrument? Do you know what I'm saying? People people are not going to invest in you if they don't see some self investment first. Mm. Um, that's always a good test of of whether you are serious about what you're doing mm. or whether it's just a whim. Mm. So I would encourage anybody invest in yourself, invest in yourself, invest in yourself. I like that. I love that because um, I do still meet people who are looking for someone to phone them or bump <laughs> up into them in the road or <laughs> forming and say, hey, we want you. You know, they, they, they're looking for that. <laughs> you know, like you see them films, you're just a person I need. I'm like, that. you know, they're still, and I'm thinking, what? Yes. You know, yes. it's DIY, baby. We're in a DIY yeah. world. It's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's just, it's not going to happen. I think, I think the X Factor and some of the shows have painted a completely false reality yes. um, for, for what's going on at the moment in the music industry. So people think, if I get with somebody that's doing something, then I'm going to be able to do something. Uh. Um, but I, I really cannot advocate enough how much it means for you to invest in yourself. Yeah. Um, when, when we first built the studio and, and Polydor said to me, we can build the studio, it was part of an advance. Now, I remember saying to people, oh, I've signed a record deal and they were saying, well, what are you doing catching the bus? And I'm thinking, well, all the money that I signed off this contract went into a studio. Mm. I didn't have a car at the time. <laughs> right. And Michael, Michael used to, Michael had a car. Yeah. And Michael used to say to me, people think you're crazy, you know, Tony, because mm. most people go out and look after themselves. They get a record deal. It's all about, yeah, you know, look, I'm about, and I'm thinking, oh, I've invested all this money into a studio. Mm. There was stuff I didn't have in my house. Mm. You know, I was, I was newly married Mm. We'd got a house and there was stuff that needed fixing, doing up and that. And, and God bless her, my wife said, okay, I understand what you're doing. I can see where you're going with this. And it was the best investment I ever made yeah. because I'm still earning from it now. It's, yeah. it's what's made me living for me now. But at the time, I was sometimes catching the bus to that studio mm -hmm. <laughs> that yes. I owned. But now, it was yeah. So you said a couple of really interesting things here. You used the word advanced. I mean, we could just explain what that really means for people who don't understand it. That's my first. Well, I think in the well in the days, I think this still, still is the case. When you sign to um, most major labels, they give you an advance of money um, once you sign the contract. So it could be for um, your first year, you get a certain amount of money to produce an album for them. 
Um, and on the second year, they'll give you another advance to produce another album for them. And normally, it's, it's an escalating scale, so it goes up each year if you've produced your album and done your, your music for them. Um, but that advance is paid back from your royalties. Ah. Um, what a lot of artists don't realise is it's a loan. It's not free money. Mm-hmm. So that, that's where you hear the stories of artists that say, I'm broke, I've got no money, and I've been ripped off. It's not necessarily that. It's just that when you when you sign to a record company, they will put all this money into you. You can shoot your videos. You can have all the food laid out at your videos. You can be treated like royalty. You can have limos. You can have whatever you want. Mm. But once your record starts to sell, they're just ticking off the money that they've paid to you in the first place and going, well, you owe us that, you owe us this. So when your record's multi-platinum and you've got a plaque on your wall saying you've sold a million records, mm. the record company goes, yeah, but you owe us 1.5 million after all of the stuff you've done. Wow. So you're actually still in debt. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds, I mean, I, I understand how it works, but it sounds like they give you this money at the beginning, which is like, say they give you uh, 50,000 at the beginning for the year, you think, great, yeah. blow it. And then year two, they say, okay, royalties 80, uh, we, we, we need that 50 back, so you're not going to get yeah. So when do you actually get paid? You know, <laughs> you've bought the car, you've got the studio. It's like they're giving it to you and then they're taking it back. So you're back on zero, it seems. How, yeah, do, you, exactly. how do you make it? <laughs> it seems like... What's going on? It's very difficult to make money with major labels. You have to, mm. you have to be selling in the millions to make mm. money out of them because they claw back everything. Um, wow. There is, there is um, what they call a claw back on, on all of the stuff. So they, they really do itemize everything they spend on you. Mm. So you really have to be selling records. And I, I pity people that are signing them now. I would not sign to a major deal now. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but. The, the thing that they do now is what they call 360 deals, where it's a case of they now take percentages of every part of your career. So they will take a percentage of your merchandise. They'll take a percentage of your videos, your songs, publishing. Everything is tied up now in, a, in one record deal. Mm. In my day, it was simply a record deal. You could go out and sign a publishing deal separately. Mm. Um, which was always a good thing because your song stayed separate to the record company. Mm-hmm. Um, these days, not so. They sign you for everything, so literally you are locked up. Wow. And how long are you locked up for? <laughs> that depends on what your contract is. You could It could be a year, it could be five years. Um, and your music, is your songs are tied up for 25. Wow. So you can't <laughs> get the rights to those songs or do you have some right? You it's all signed them. over to them. Yeah. Wow. That that is not good. <laughs> it isn't. It isn't. And it's and, and that's why I say for people that want to do music now, I'd say you have to be passionate about it mm-hmm. and you have to look at ways to actually do it yourself. Rather than I think the danger is to go around saying, Oh, I want a deal, I want somebody to put all this investment into me. Yeah, they will do that, but it's going to come at a cost. Uh, mm-hmm. um, I, I think the best way at the moment, and anybody in the industry is going to tell you, the best way at the moment is independence. It's a do-it-yourself. It's harder, but everything's coming back into your own pocket. Yeah, good point. So um, you got this advance, and the, the other point was, uh, it was good to hear that your wife said, I believe in you, but how did she, <laughs> how did, did she, I mean, I know your wife, I'm not going to mention her name because it's going to be killing me, but... How did that really go? I mean, did you say, it's okay, uh, Tommy, it really you got to do that? Yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as smooth as that. <laughs> it wasn't as smooth as that. You, I mean, you imagine, you, 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 I was, what, um, two years into my marriage, I'd, we bought a house. Yeah. Um, there was practically no kitchen. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, no, I thought, well, I, I got, uh, uh. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so the, the, the house needed gutting practically. And, yeah. There's me, get a healthy sum of money, uh-huh. and I'm going, yeah. I'm going Are you going to say how much a healthy it. sum was? Come on. Ah, <laughs> going to dig that bit a bit deeper. Well, it could have done the I'm house. You could have remodeled the house, right? <laughs> She'd have that walk-in closet she wanted. <laughs> that kitchen that's just with a middle counter in there, you know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I tell you, it's, it's um, yeah, it didn't exactly go like 
you know, oh, yes, love, it's all right. Go yeah, yeah, yeah. Spend all the money. It was really a case of, are you serious? I'm <laughs> like, yeah, trust me, I think it's going to work. We will be able to, to get the house done, but not right now. Yeah, yeah. Can we defer the house and let me do this? Because I think as a business, it will work. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a precarious minute, it looked like, oh, is it going to? Yeah, yeah. And with the sort of stuff happening with the group on the label as well, mm-hmm. um, it, there was a precarious minute or two. Mm. But um, thank God, you know, it, it eventually worked its way through and I started to to be able to earn off the production side of things. Yeah. Um, and the publishing side of things as well. So, yeah, it, it worked out, thank God. Excellent. <laughs> or else you'd be in a divorce court. I know. <laughs> like, you imagine yeah, your right. kids were... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, as, 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 I mean, I think my wife said initially, look, we can't live in a studio, can we? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you've got to grant it the valid point. We can't. Yeah. We've got to live in a house. But I believe that it will pay for what we want. Mm, and that yeah. was, it was deferring the satisfaction of, yeah. deferred satisfaction. Yes. <laughs> got there. So here, here's, here's a question then. So what would you say is one of your career highs? If you think of the whole 30 years, what would we say? Yeah. This was my career high. This is something I really enjoyed and why I really enjoyed it. It was a high point for me. Oh, good question. Um, you know, the problem with me, I am so um, hard on myself mm. that I don't even... It's hard for me to actually look at things and go, oh, that was such a great time. It's so fantastic. I always look at it as, yeah, it could have been better. Okay. Um, so I I can't even say I look at things as high. There were some good times that I had and good things happened. Um no, they say one of the good things, maybe somebody you worked with or an experience going somewhere that you thought that was really good. Um, I, oh, gosh. You know what? I think sometimes it's, it's, it's not about the money or the, um, the sort of famous side of it. It's literally doing something where, for me, it's more about me probably writing something and somebody going, I love that song. That song meant this to me. Okay. Um, and I've had that happen a couple of instances um, where somebody actually said to me, do you realise what that song meant to me? What did you, What were you thinking when you wrote it? Mm. And um, I've actually thought, wow, you mean you sat and... And there was a young lady that said to me, I actually, <clears throat> I actually choreographed a dance to one of the songs you wrote. Oh, that's lovely. It, it, it meant so much to me. It was... And I, I did this dance with people because it, it really meant this to me. Is that what you meant when you wrote it? And I thought, oh, actually, yeah, you, you, you got it. That's what I actually meant when I wrote the song. Hmm. Um, and there's instances like that that have happened. I think I also wrote a song for Kenny Thomas um, that he he actually said to me, I got inside his head. Um, and that was brilliant because I, I thought about him when I was writing it and mm. he found me up and when I gave him the song and he said you know what I can't believe you've lyrically put into a song how I feel and how I'm actually thinking did and you get did some it. of the did you get some of the pointers from him or you just wrote it and presented it I just thought about him okay thought, wow you know, the singer wow. I thought okay he's had this great success he's mm-hmm. at a stage in his career now where is this Mm-hmm. He's probably a man that's settled in his life in certain ways, and these are the things that he's probably facing. Mm-hmm. And I just wrote from that perspective. Mm-hmm. And it, thank God it was just bang on. And, and he recorded the song, and I produced the song for him. Um, and he, he actually said, you know, that really was, uh, that got inside his head. I think that was something that made me feel really, really good. It's worth it. After yeah. all those, it's yeah. worth it when you yeah. can... It didn't just go by the buyers. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. nice sound. Yeah. yeah. But it actually meant something to somebody. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like that as well with my music. I like when someone mm-hmm. said it meant something for me. It helped yeah. to get me through. You're thinking, yeah. oh, this is what it's all about. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not just about the dots and the notes. It's about yeah. <clears throat> helping someone in some way, you know. Exactly. It's, uh, yeah. I'm so rewarding. I think, I think so rewarding. that's invaluable. I think that's invaluable. And I think it means it means more to me than than... People always say, oh, have you met anybody famous? Have you done this? And you say, yeah, you have. And 
there are there are nice times when you work with people and, and you meet people and you think, oh, okay, yeah, they're nice people. But mm-hmm. for somebody to connect with what you're doing um, and not just as a business sort of person, mm-hmm. but connect with you as, a, as an artist and as a writer and as someone, I think that's that's really special. Cool. So here, here's the opposite. What was what would you say is one of your career lows? Because looking on, <laughs> looking on, I, I could see all these wonderful accolades and stuff. Oh, Can you name do a you want me to those? <laughs> no, just one, just one. We don't need those. We just need one. Wow, amazing. Now, don't worry, we're not yet finished. Next time, Tony will share some of his career highs and lows dealing with personalities in the studio, um, things around home and work-life balance, and of course, his five tips for you, how to develop as a music producer. And while you're waiting, why not check out some of the previous episodes of my podcast, Success Beyond the School? And I have a free booklet called Revealed, 25 Secrets of the Successful Gigging Musician, Singer, Rapper and Spoken Word Artist. And you can get that on www.successbeyondthescore.com. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye for now.